The annual civic parade in the Stanley Urban District near Wakefield, a familiar scene in April all over the country as civic heads begin their year in office. But this year in Stanley, there's a difference. It's not the civic dignitaries who occupy the place of honor behind the band, but a mines rescue team. For within the urban district lies Lofthouse Gate, and the colliery where, ten days before, seven men had lost their lives on face south, 9B. I was just going up the road to go to Wakefield to pick my granddaughter up, and a, a man stopped me halfway up Coach Road and told me. He said one of the eggs, but he didn't say which one or what shift it had happened on. I just heard it was one of the eggs, and because you sort of panic and go numb. The emergency started early this morning when a powerful surge of water burst through a coal face where 30 men were working. Most of the miners managed to force their way through shoulder deep water and escape, but seven miners are missing. During the next six days, newsmen followed the frantic activities of the workers to reach their mates by every means, in the faint hope that some of them might be alive, trapped in an air pocket. Pumps and miles of pipe brought in and sent down the shaft to reclaim the inundator, but it was still very slow work, and there was little friends and relatives on the surface could do but wait. Three from the pit head, almost directly over the heads of the trapped men, three mysterious holes had appeared in farmland ploughed only the day before, and this was in an area riddled with old mine workings. Meanwhile, surveyors fixed a point on the surface, estimated to be directly above the entombed men. A drilling rig was caught and set up with the aid of gangs of miners. By day two, the rig's 12-inch bit had been put to work, cutting down through the 730 feet, which separated it from the coal face below. Apart from snatching a few hours nearby houses, the drill crew paused only to down drink hot meals brought onto the site for them by local housewives. In an effort to plug the disused mine shafts, a fleet of lorries brought tons of clay, straw and rubble to the end of a conveyor. This, it was hoped, would stop any further flow of water into the devastated area below. Apart from the highly trained rescue teams who came in from all over the surrounding coal fields, dozens of ordinary miners provided the vital backup to the rescue operation. It that the coal board's own team of frogmen arrived from their base in Staffordshire. Instead of a final training session at Hensford, this newly formed divers had its first real job to do oft house. On day three, the water level continued to fall, although the sticky mixture of water and coal hindered progress. Rescue teams continued to come and go, but by now the life expectancy of any miners trapped below in an air pocket had been exceeded by several hours. On day four of the emergency, the rescuers decided that attempts to pump away the flood water were going too slowly. They devised an ingenious plan. Two-man teams were set to work tunneling towards the air pocket above the flooded roadway, carving with air picks a two-foot by three-foot passage through the solid rock above the steel arches of the old tunnel. They worked for 12-hour shifts up to their shoulders in water. They promised four yards an hour, incredibly, they managed three. One man was Sid Haig, and on day five, he spent his 58th birthday tunneling toward his trapped son. On the surface, the drilling head is still driving its way down toward the trapped men. The work was begun on the borehole as a secondary line of attack. It's now thought the drill may reach the air pockets. On day six, it's one of Lofthouse's own rescue teams that makes the breakthrough. They wade through chin-high water into the area of the supposed air pocket. Near 100 yards further on, they find the roadway blocked again, the area deep. There has been, but no one has breathed it. Shortly after midday, one body is found. And at a press conference, the NCB senior executive on the spot, Norman Siddall, explains there's now no reasonable hope for the remaining six men. It is obvious that the inrush was of great violence and it is difficult to see how anybody could have survived after. 
I would like to pay tribute to the workmen and officials and management of this pit for the, and indeed others who have helped, for the tremendous courage and tenacity they have displayed in attempting this rescue, which has unfortunately been aborted. With all real hope for the miners gone, so was the possibility of dramatic developments hour by hour, press and tea pulling out. But as the operation changed from fevered attempts at rescue to the much slower process of recovery, the story for the community of Outwood was only now really beginning. And just in time before the world turned its back, the new chairman arrived to launch his council's appeal fund and submit himself to more outstanding dignities on behalf of his fellow Yorkshiremen. Walking up past the colliery with some of the other miners. Oh, I've got more than that. Yeah. As chairman of Stanley Urban District Council, in whose area Lofthouse Colliery is situated, may I publicly, publicly express on behalf of the council our profound sympathy to the bereaved and our unfailing gratitude to those men who tried to rescue their colleagues. The breadwinners in seven families are gone, and for this reason I am sponsoring a fund done as a Lofthouse Colliery Disaster Fund. I hope that you will all try and give whatever you can. As the world moved on to other dramas, this tight-knit mining community was left to measure its own reaction to the tragedy. One who's lived in the area for many years and knows the mine as well is the Bishop of Wakefield, Dr. Eric Tracy. How did he see the impact on the community at large? I find it to be a quite numbing one. Uh, uh, they find it very hard to focus on exactly what has happened and to realize that as they walked about in Wakefield doing their daily tasks as underground with seven men whose fate was unknown, whose wives and families were waiting here in this canteen, since last Wednesday to find out what happened. In a curious way, the sense of identity, not only with the men underground, but with their families, has affected an enormous number of people. I felt there's been a sort of cloud over Wakefield since last Wednesday. Three miles away, the drilling rig waited to be dismantled. This first operation of its kind in Britain had in the end been in vain. The crew had worked long hours in an attempt to put Dalit hole to the supposed air pocket to be stopped short of their objective by news that the air pocket had been reached low and found empty. Our managing director, I think he was moved nearly to tears like as he wasn't there because all hopes had been pinned on finding them. But we would try any time, even again, you know, if we thought that there was someone trapped down below and we could do anything with our drilling machine to get down to them we'll do it again. A group of local suburban housewives found themselves totally involved with the rescue operation. Why had they felt so personally concerned about the trapped miners? I think we're human beings. Yeah. And being when so you can close, see it, actually yeah. being able to look out of the window and knowing probably that they're not so many feet or couldn't perhaps be so many feet from underneath where you're standing. You know, they'd just been across the road. How did the men on the drill react? News that the miners were probably dead. Well, they, they were just quiet. They, they just didn't say anything. They just went very quiet. Mm. We walked out of that tent and nobody spoke a word no. at all. Now that it's all over, what would you say you've all learned about the mining industry? Well, I think it's a dangerous industry. I don't think anybody quite realised how dangerous, no. you know. They have a community of their own. I don't know, they're all friends. I don't know, they're no, companionship. Yes. You know, probably yeah. like you'd get during the war. It needs something like this, I think, to concentrate people's minds on what are the risks. When I go down, I crawl on my, on my stomach to the coal face. I spend a few minutes talking to them, then I crawl out again. I go up to the top, have a bath, go home, and uh, perhaps talk to somebody about my visits in the pit. I realize that those chaps are down there every single day of their lives, uh, lying on, uh, on their faces, hacking the coal out, breathing the filthy air, constantly 
aware of the fact that anything could go wrong, but thank God it goes wrong far less now than it did. Although I'm told that there's about one miner every five days who loses his life in the pits in this country as a whole. Statistics like that raise no eyebrows in Stanley Urban District. It's a community born of coal. As north of Wakefield, it sits astride the main road to Leeds, a road much quieter than one took away the through traffic. Otherwise, at first sight, changed very little in recent years. Blocks of pre council houses still fill the spaces between older rows of miners' cottages. But in outward, the area to the pit itself, signs of are more obvious. Old cottages give way to modern bungalows for commuters to Leeds and Wakefield. But even in normal times, the pit makes its presence felt, looming over the smart gardens of the council estate. Stanley Urban District Council's official still makes it quite clear that mining is the main local industry. And in case anyone should forget, the seal on the chairman's chain of office is a constant reminder. But for the moment, no one seems in doubt. The entire staff at the council offices has come out the morning to tot up the response to the chairman's appeal, an appeal which is to raise £70,000 before the fund is officially... Mr. Flanagan, £3. Pounds. Oh, VG Practice, £5. Pounds. Let us remember the daily courage, comradeship and hard work of the mines. Let us remember thankfully the tremendous response of the miners who helped in the rescue attempt. O oh Lord of life, we remember in your presence those who have died in this tragedy. May we support their families in their grief and their loss. May we learn more about safety in the mines that some good may come from this loss. May the courage and comradeship which has been shown bind us together into a loving and serving community through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Courage and comradeship are the rule among miners, but at the same time there's nothing sentimental about their sympathy. Ten days after the disaster, Sid Haig, who lost one of his three sons who work at Loft House in the disaster, talked to workmate's attitude. Well, I don't know. I can't, uh, I can't assess it because I'm always... I'm always uh, said that I'm a hard man, see. Hard man, but a good gaffer, you know. I don't... Uh, when any of my lads get injured, I never show any sympathy. And I don't ask for sympathy, and th this is why they class me as a hard man, you see. And they only see what's on top when it happens to your own. They don't see what's underneath. They express sympathy, of course which is a natural thing among miners. Looking back on it, Sid, how would you say that Loft House Colliery has altered your attitude to mining as a job? Well, it's a lifetime's work, you see. It hasn't altered my attitude to mining at all. This do not worry me one bit. The only thing that worries me about this, or I'm disappointed about this, is the efforts we put in. So tried to save lives, it's been unsuccessful. This is the part that hurts you. But you've got many grandchildren, haven't you? How would you feel about them going into mining in view of what's just happened? Well, same as my own family. If they want to go into mining, all right. It's a good job. 
It's a good job. I, I don't associate mining any more dangerous than lots of other jobs, such as fishing. A fisherman's job to me is just as hard as mine. I would go out on tallers fishing. If I'm comfortable down pit. Don't worry me being down pit. Because it's an environment that I enjoy. Seven a.m. on the second of April, twelve days after the disaster, and while we recover the remaining six bodies goes on, production shifts since the disaster goes down Lofthouse Colliery. Though the clatter of pit boots is accompanied this morning by very little chatter, there's obviously no reluctance to get back to work in that environment that so many, like Sid Haig, seem to enjoy. Stanley is a district which provides well for its old folk. Eight community centres dotted about the district serve all-purpose meeting places. And in one of these centres, a group of old pitmen talked about the life that they had enjoyed. Well, I enjoyed it while I was there. I started when I was 13. I started as an office boy in the pit bottom. And then I gradually worked myself up into a different grade. I did every degrade there were, from haulage, pony driving, timbering, coal face working, shot firing. How proud are you of the fact? Oh, I'm proud at time. Very proud. You know, in those days, we had no choice. We'd go to bed as soon as we left school. Uh, I did 52 years in bed. And I did nearly 58 loft hours. And that my father and seven sons worked at bed. Father and seven sons. When I was a young fellow, and uh, the manager came um, round and he come round with his wife. He said to me, how many children have you? Frank, I said, I have four boys. So he said, my word, he said, we shall have four good colliers, shall we? I said, not on your life, sir. What do you mean? I said, I wouldn't allow him to come and have your job. That's how I feel about it. Why do you feel so bitter about mining? Because we were hurt that much. Thomas, do you feel like that about mining? No, no, no. It's all right in mining. But it it was a lot better in the olden days than what it is now, in my opinion. Look, to us as outsiders, it's a dirty, dangerous yes. job without any compensations at all. Well, what are the compensations? Yes, it's because you're not brought up into it, are you? We brought up, we bred and bought, brought up in the, in the pit. And as such, we don't know any different. And if it's my time to come over again, I suppose I should go into the same. Because I like the mining. I like bitwalk. I should like. It's bred in you, isn't yeah. it? What about the women folk of a mining community? Well, the, do they share this feeling? They do, the the do to a point, but they don't like it. They're thinking about the men folk, who's away all day, and they're just looking through the windows when it's nearer time. When I was uh, to, to no, Newmarket, as my pudding and the Yorkshire puddings never went into the oven till they saw the pit bus. When the solar pit was there and they could just look and see, it's coming up. There was twelve, it's coming up. So, all right, get him in the top. Annie Collins spends much of her time now looking after the interests of old miners. Her father, husband, father in law, and two brothers were all miners. How did she feel seeing her man off to the pit every day? Well, naturally, you get up on the morning, as we always did, and got, the, got them a bit of something ready before they went to work and put their lunch up, which consisted of probably two slices of bread, either a bottle of cold water or a bottle of cold tea. And they take that along with them and you sort of say good morning. And then you wonder what time they're going to return. And it's an hour take all day, many, all day long, you keep giving them thoughts and thinking, I should be glad when it's time for them to come home. And when you do see them return, you just feel to yourself, well, that's another day over. But to my way of thinking, any woman who's married a miner lives in fear all her life, whatever is down the mine. 
But a disaster brings hidden fears like that to the surface. Would Mrs. Haig like to see her husband leave the pit now? Well, yes. I think every woman now round here would like their husband to come out of pit. We don't have to express these fears to men because they think, well, you know, sometimes they say, well, you're talking silly, or I'll be all right, and so you keep these thoughts to yourself. Would you ask them to leave? No. No, it's for them to decide. I think you sort of live for each other. And what pleases your husband, you usually try to think it pleases you. Or you try to do, at any rate. I think there are a lot of wives in this district who would be happy to see their husbands leave the pit. Yes, I'm fully sure of it. But you can't disturb minors to that extent. You have to try to be as peaceful as you can, knowing fully well that they will never speak of conditions or what happens or anything while they're down there. So you have to let them go with a contented mind. And contentment's a great thing, I think, to a minor. Contentment is obviously vital to all men with potentially dangerous occupations. Even though they live in every working day, disaster, when it strikes, still takes them by surprise. Of course, well, it couldn't happen, but it has happened. And yet you've got to uh, take it home and live with it. It's there. But you yeah, are sort of well, numb. When I get to bed at night, it's running through my mind all the time, you know, till I fall to sleep. It's in every dance, in it happened. We think that much about them because we're brothers in arms. Uh, I suppose that's the reason. We're human beings. And I suppose then some young people will pass on and say, well, to the children, the same thing. And they will say, say well, didn't they get them out? You know, that feeling of, of comradeship will exist forever and ever. You knew Billy Bunting, didn't you, Billy Bunting? Beard on? Uh, when he was working at 75 at, at Nelson, Newmarket, I went down to go and sit with him a bit. I, I was only in my teen, if I was 15, 16. He told me about the deep drop. And he said this is that many men, there were so many men in there then, and they're still in now. That's on the old pit on Lime Pit Lane. The spoil heaps of deep drop are today overgrown with birch trees and what remains of the pit head itself is surrounded by rhubarb and Brussels sprouts, but memories of disasters remain the folklore of any mining community. Here on the 4th of March 1879, only a mile from the present Lofthouse Colliery, an explosion of fire killed 20 men over a widespread area underground. In 19th century mining disasters, hundreds died annually, but any thought of leaving the victims underground was always repulsive. Stories still circulate in Outwood of the number of men left underground here at deep drop, though of course seem to indicate that all 20 bodies were eventually recovered, local accounts of miners entombed at the bottom of this shaft still persist. Local memory of disaster may be long, but did Sid Haig think people at large would forget what happened at Loft House? Yes, well, I think they will. It'll die down, it'll die away. It'll die away at pit, I think. It'll die away at pit if they get these people out. But if it, if it did come to a time when uh, the board officials thought that it was too dangerous to attempt to get these bodies out, then I think there'd be upheaval at Loft House Colony. In my mind, if they decided to leave my son in, although I've been in 44 years, I wouldn't go down pit again. I'd pack it up. But as the days and weeks passed, no progress seemed to be made toward the vital objective of recovering the bodies. Finally, on the 28th of April, 38 days after the disaster, a meeting of all the men at the pit was called at the Outward Empire. Rumours of sealing off the disaster zone had circulated with stories of conditions in the devastated area from the few who had been there. The men knew there could really only be vision from that meeting. I think at the end of the road, they've made the right and proper decision that we should have to entomb these people or the uh, people that's been 
lost in the disaster in that particular area. How did Sid Haig and his fellow rescue workers feel about the decision now that it had been taken? Well, I travelled both gates on Thursday, and having seen the conditions myself, I entirely agree that, in my opinion, I wouldn't like to ask for volunteers. I would be as exposing them danger and the risk that's not warranted. <coughs> so I, I say no. I let my lad stay where he is, along with the others. My own opinion, I'd like to go and get them out. But you've got to go with, with the uh, people what's more knowledge and what's more experience than me, although I've been in mining life all my life. Well, I'm a local boy, like all my colleagues here is, and I should be a poor man to walk about this village, to think that that sanction for a man to go in there, lose his life, the nation will go against us, and everyone else in the village uh, cry shame on us, which will be fair enough as well. You talked to us earlier, yes. in the, after the disaster, and you told us that if the bodies weren't recovered, you would leave the pit. That's what I said. But of course, um, this, of course, was a real decision at that particular time. But seeing the conditions of the gate, of both gates, in fact, now, I've got to repent that decision because I think I, um, for a few years I've left to work a bit, I'd rather pass my knowledge on to other people while I still remain at Loft House. Are you all aware at the height of that tunnelling operation that it was really in vain that uh, no, all the men no, are no, at that time? No, not at the time, no. Do nothing in vain until we knew for certain. Till we got there was no that. effort too big until we knew for certain there were no life. Of course we, te we took these risks. Of course we knew that another inrush of water would trap us. Mm. But this is a chance you take for life. You, get, you take this chance, you don't worry about risks. When you're fighting for life, you take all the risks it, it involves. And now, of course, there is no life, so there's no point in risking life. But it leaves the situation a little bit now. The decision has yeah. been made. Yeah. And of course, the, con the Gwynny Concert is a piece of ground where this happened at Low Lathe's uh, golf, golf links, somewhere around that area. And they're going to set a memorial up with an access rope to it. And it's going to be maintained by the coal board in, as a memorial to these, five, these six lads that are still down there. A week later, on the 6th of May, a memorial service in Dr. Tracy's cathedral field lends an air of finality to the disaster. The official inquiry opens in Wakefield next Wednesday, but with this memorial service comes a sense of relief for the family workmates of the dead miners. From today, they can begin to push further back in their minds the tragedy which struck the mining community of Lofthouse and yet stirred us all with its stories of the courage, plus determination of the rescue workers. Remembering is still important. On the drill site, there's little at the moment to remind anyone of the six men entombed below. But soon the memorial garden in this area will provide a more significant reminder of men than any churchyard stone.